for all of you here. We're pleased to have you in our presence and in attendance here to consider some things from God's Word. Um, I decided to try to get back to a little bit of basics. So you're probably going to hear a whole bunch of what you already know, but I think there's some lessons in what uh, we'll be reading and some of the things that we have that we can bring out in maybe more clarity than you've seen, that you've considered before. If not, it's going to be review for you. We look around us and in, here in, in the last uh, few days, I know out at my house, we've been blessed with a lot of rainfall. And uh, we're certainly thankful for that. And we see things that happen after the rainfall. All of a sudden, the desert comes into bloom and things that you didn't even know were there start to spring up. And you begin to see the glory of our Father in heaven and how He cares for His creation and through the plans that He has for His creation, how it uh, even takes place in a dry and thirsty land even like we live in in Arizona. So as I look around, I see these things, these marvelous things that happen, and I scratch my head and I uh, ask myself the question, how do these things happen? How does that work? And I'm sure that you have the same situation and have the same uh, responses from time to time. So I'd like to, for you to turn to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, we're going to be doing a fair amount of reading this morning, but I think it's important for us to review and to understand what God, Jehovah God, has revealed for us to learn about Him and about His creation. In verse 1, In the beginning God created the heavens, heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the, um, of the, water, of the um, deep, and the Spirit of, of God was hovering above the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and he called the darkness night. And evening and morning were the first day. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So evening and morning were the second day. So in the first couple of days, we read here that Jehovah spoke, and the heavens and the, and the, and were created, and the earth were created. And it says basically that the, uh, the earth was without form, and it was void. In essence, what I draw, the conclusion I draw from that, it was kind of like a blob. God created the earth, and it was like a blob. The Spirit of God was hovering above the waters. And then Jehovah spoke again, and he created something called a firmament. And I oftentimes have to look some of these words up, and, um, and so I looked this one up. Firmament comes from, I'm told, a word, rakaya. Rakaya means heavens or sky, a sphere or an expanse. That's what he did. He created a firmament. First of all, there was nothing. There wasn't anything. Then there was. No huge movement of mass, no huge explosion. God spoke, and what wasn't now is. Continuing in verse 9, 
Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and gathered together the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth grass and herb that yields seed, and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind, whose fruit is in itself on the earth, and it was so. And, God, and the earth brought forth grass and the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw it was good. So the evening and the morning were the third day. Then God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens to divide the day from the night, and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years, and let them be lights in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth, and it was so. Then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night, and he made the stars also. God sent them, set them in the firmament of the heavens to give light on the earth and to rule over the day and over the night and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. So the evening and the morning were the fourth day. So during that span of time, God made the land. He made it appear, and he called it the earth. He separated the waters, and he gathered the waters together, and he called them seas. He created the grass and the herbs and the fruit trees, the fruit of which inside the fruit is the seed itself. Then God set, the, set lights in the firmaments of the heavens to divide the day from the night and to let the seasons be known by days and years according to their movement. When I read that, I uh, think about the immenseness of what God created. The closest star, we're told, is one called Proxima Centauri. That particular star is 4.4 light years from Earth. In other words, the light that it emits takes 4.4 years to get here. So when we see it through a telescope, the light rays that we observe are already 4.4 years old. Our sun, a mere 500 light seconds from Earth, emits light, and the light we see is already 500 seconds old. Our moon is only about 1.34 light seconds from Earth, and you can do the arithmetic. The farthest known detectable, and I say detectable, galaxy from Earth is now understood or thought to be 13.4 billion light years from Earth. So how do we know that? I don't know. I do know that they sent a, a telescope up which they called uh, Hubble. And the first thing that they decided to do with Hubble was to focus it upon the, what they perceived to be the darkest part of the universe. And they did an extended light expo time exposure pho photograph of that particular observation. I am told that the exposure was 11 hours into the darkest part of the universe, only to find millions of galaxies that they had no idea they were there. That caused them to make a new estimate of how many galaxies there were. 
billion galaxies is what they estimate, according to that observation, to be true. Understand, they're like looking through a straw at a certain part of the universe. What's elsewhere? But they took that and extrapolated it and made that uh, particular estimate. So I'm going to leave you with some homework. I was going to show you some pictures of some of the things that Hubble has seen and we have seen because of Hubble. They're absolutely beautiful pictures. Your homework is to look, the, look up Hubble. Look at the recent discoveries or the discoveries of Hubble and you'll see some of those photographs. Distances beyond comprehension Vast beyond imagination, beauty beyond belief. Distances so far that we can only say that they are apparent because of the time it would take the light to get here. They probably don't even look that way anymore, unless God wills it to be. So Hubble shut down the other day and they fired it back up on the uh, backup computer, but they had known that there was going to have to be a, a, a successor to Hubble. So what's to come is the James Webb Space Telescope. Who knows what it's going to see? So take some time, do your homework, look up Hubble discoveries, and observe the beautiful pictures that you can see that we now see because of that. Would you join me in singing uh, verse 3 of How Great Thou Art? If you're at home, number 5 in your hymnal. How Great Thou Art. O Lord my God, when I things, all the things that he created, I'd like to continue our reading as we go down through, uh, beginning in verse 20, then God said, let the waters abound with the abundance of living creatures, and let the birds fly uh, above the uh, earth across the face of the firmament in the heavens. So God created the great sea creatures and every living thing that moves, which, uh, with which waters abounded according to their kind, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. And God blessed them, saying, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. So the evening and the morning were the fifth day. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature, according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing, and beast of the, of the earth, each according to its kind, and it was so. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind, and God saw it was good. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. 
So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female created He them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, See, I have given you every herb, herb that yields fruit, uh, le- yields seed, which is in the face of the earth, and given you every tree that yields seed to you, it shall be food. Also, to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and everything that creeps on the earth, in which there is life, I have given every green herb for food, and it was so. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. He created the living creatures, the birds that fly, everything, the sea creatures that are in the sea, in the oceans. He created all things that uh, make up the creatures that inhabit the land, like the cattle and the other beasts that we see roaming around. Then he created man. And as we have read, he did that in six days. Day one is described in only 88 words. Day two, 65. Day three, 133 words. Day four, 131 words. Day five, and only 87. But day six, when he created man, it is described in 279 words. That's how he created us and how he described the creation of us in his own image. I don't know, but that kind of seems like that tells me something about humankind's worth in the whole scheme of of the uh, creation. The universe, huge in scope. Jehovah created it. All that is so incredibly large down to all that is incredibly, so incredibly small as to be imperceivable, He created. All that we have discovered and all we are yet to discover, He created and knows them by name. The creation, described in 783 words, and Jehovah said, it is very good. So, I would suggest to you that taking this account in its literal terms, I'm saying six literal days, the universe and the entire, uh, and everything in the universe was created. It's a huge, huge, unimaginable mass that he created. Where there wasn't anything, he spoke. And six days later, it was there. That is the power and the capacity of Jehovah our God. The God that we worship every Sunday when we come down here. Of our universe, the psalmist says in Psalm 19, the following, if you'd like to turn there, we're going to read the first few verses of Psalm 19. Beginning in verse 1, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech or, nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has drawn, uh, gone out through all the earth their words to the end of the earth. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, S-U-N, our star, 
which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man in his race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. That's what the psalmist said about the creation of the universe that we live in. Paul puts it this way, or rather, I would ask you the question, then what happened? Well, in a nutshell, man sinned. This separated him from Jehovah. He was in quite a fix. However, God had a plan. Part of creation included a plan for man to be reconciled to Jehovah, the great creator. Paul put it this way in Titus chapter 1. I want to turn over there. Titus chapter 1. We're going to read the first few verses about this, this plan that was put in place. When he wrote to Titus, he started his letter in, in this way. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and an acknowledgement of the truth which is according to godliness in hope of eternal life which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began, but has in due time manifested His word through preaching, which was committed to me according to the commandment of God our Savior, to Titus my true son, in our common faith, grace, mercy, peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus our Savior. There was a plan in creation that God had to, um, to redeem man from the fix he was in. That is our Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. So how did that happen? Turn back to Luke chapter 1. In Luke chapter 1, I'd like to begin the reading in verse 26. Now, this is speaking about after John the Baptist uh, uh, had been conceived and everything. So we're kind of picking it up midstream uh, here. It says, Now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, an angel, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled by this saying, and, uh, and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel of the Lord said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth uh, a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom, of his kingdom there will be no end. Well, excuse me. A virgin giving birth? This troubled Mary. And it also caught Joseph off guard too. We won't read that part though, but if you continue the reading here, and Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since no, I know no man? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One is to be born, is called, is to, will be called the Son of God. 
So let's review for a minute. Virgin birth, just as it had been promised 700 years prior to that, Isaiah 7, verses 10 through 14, if you would like to read that. So how did that work? Again, you kind of shrug your shoulders, but the Holy Spirit would be involved, and the Holy One would be called the Son of God. Of Him, if you turn to John chapter 1, of the Son of God, it is written in verse 1 of chapter 1 of John, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not com comprehend it. So Jesus came, some believed, some didn't believe. Some saw the light, some did not comprehend the light. Again of him, it said, the word came and became flesh, verse 14, and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In him, the Son of God, and by him were all things created. And then when he got here, he did several miracles. I listed a few. He cleansed the leper. Centurion, who had a paralytic uh, servant, was healed. Peter's mother-in-law, who was suffering from a fever, was healed. The Sea of Galilee was stilled. Peace, be still. Demons cast out and dispatched to pigs. Another paralytic was healed. Life restored Jairus' uh, uh, daughter and Lazarus to be two of them that I've listed. Sight was restored to people like the guy that was asked to go down to the pool of Siloam to wash. 5,000 were fed. Jesus walked on water. So did Peter, for that matter, for a while. Feeding of 4,000 changing water to wine, making fishers of men, to name a few. So what did they do? They beat him. They mocked him. They spat on him. And they crucified him. But he himself was resurrected from the dead on the third day. And when I think that God is Son not sparing, sent Him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, He bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. How great Thou art, how great Thou art. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, came to this earth. He came as a remedy for our sins. In Him, we have salvation by remission of our sins. We have to do some things. In Matthew chapter 11, in verses 28 and following, He says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you a rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20, 
He said, go into the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them and, uh, and making disciples of all nations. In Acts chapter 22, Paul put it this way. When he was recounting the uh, situation as uh, he was um, uh, remembering what uh, uh, had happened with Ananias when Ananias came preaching to him, we pick up the reading in verse 12. It says, Then one Ananias, a devout man, according to the law, having good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me, and he stood uh, and said to me, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And that same hour I looked up at him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you, that you should, you should know his will and see the just one and hear the voice of his mouth. For you will be a witness to all men of all you have seen and heard, and now, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. So our redemption has to do with us washing our sins away. The great God of creation, the one who spoke and great masses of material were created. Wash away my sins? How does that work? Yeah, I don't know either. But I do know this, that the God that was created it was powerful enough to create what we described in chapter 1 of Genesis has told every one of us that we need to comply with His will and each of us to arise and be baptized and wash away our sins. So how does that work? Through the power of our God, the great Jehovah, and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. If you have any needs, spiritual needs, if you'll come forward at this time, there's water back here. If you wish to be baptized, you can do so today. You can have your sins washed away. As together we sing, won't you come?